the smartest man in town. In Peak Town, Virginia. USA. USA. Mr. Pete, how you doing? Uncle Pete. Uncle, Uncle Pete. Pete. Sorry, Uncle, I forgot my manners. Well, thanks for having me down. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank Pre you, folks. Appreciate for it. Down yeah. Here. Yep, yep. Wanted to catch you on a pretty day and uh, see why you're, why you're whittling a little bit and feeling up to it. That's good news. Yeah. Um, wanted to ask you a couple questions and. and, and get your feedback on some things. Uh, I guess the, the first thing I wanted to ask you was, um, you and I have never talked about this. Where were you born? In Maryland, Oxon Hill, Maryland, near Oxon Hill, Fort Foot, Maryland. Okay. It was kind of across the Potomac River from Mount Vernon. Okay, gotcha. I know where Oxon Hill is. And from there you went to? When I was, I was, about to graduate from high school, I was not an inspired school student in high school. And Daddy says, uh, where, are you, where are you gonna go now? Where are you gonna go to work? I sit on the water. He said, well, I guess you'll be leaving home. Uh, no, I didn't think about that. He said, I guess you'll be leaving home. But if you don't go to college, I'll help you out. A friend of his had been to Montana and inspired me to go there. And once I was in Montana on my own, I was very comfortable and finished uh, biology. We got a degree in biology at Montana State. It's 1965, went in the Coast Guard. That was when Vietnam was just cooking up. And uh, went to the Coast Guard, was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. And then while I was over there, I'd come over here gunning and fishing. After I got out, I worked for a testing lab over there, and they sent me to Bayshore, the concrete plant in Cape Charles, for a two-year job. I was there 15 minutes, and I knew I found my home. How about that? So here I am. Here you are, been here ever since. Yep. That is outstanding. And, and you started carving, making your own decoys for your own purpose, for your own rig? Yeah, I started carv carving myself at about the age 12. Wow. But my first experience with decoys, my first whatever what you call shaking hands with them, was about age 10. Me and some juvenile buddies, the juvenile delinquents buddies, were down the, at the river and found a Madison Mitchell canvas back hmm. washed up on the beach. We threw it overboard and cause who, who could bust the head off. And we could not do it. We hit, make a direct hit, and it would just roll over and roll over. And by and by, it washed ashore. And uh, we got tired. We were going to kill that duck. And we just, it would beat, clubbed it until we broke his head off. <laughs> that was my first lesson that nails hold a head on there. Mm -hmm. never, yeah. for, never forgot that lesson either. So that's something you've applied to your own birds is the strength of the head to the body. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah, they could still be knocked off, but it takes a little something to do it. More than notion just to, to I mean, it takes some rough handling. Gotcha. So you're now, you were living in um, Capeville, the Cape Charles area of Virginia, and you're carving decoys and um, with that lesson you just explained about the R. Madison Mitchell bird, um, that leads me to ask you, what influences, who, who influenced your decoy style, your decoy, the input that goes into your creative birds? Oh, it's just a, uh, a, a the summary of a lot of them. Mm -hmm. the, the upper bay birds, what I grew up on, kind of imprinted on those, and then Came came here, and uh, got a worldly view of decoys and the cobs, 
the Warrens, the Smith Island Carvers. Wow. Hog Island Carvers. It's just this is just a combination. Gotcha. Well, you can certainly see styles of all of those makers and those areas in in a lot of different birds that you make. Um, I think anybody can attest to that. that well, I, I made a lot of different versions of everything. Right. Exactly. That's what I'm getting at. Well, that's that's pretty neat. And um, um, you are carving some again now. That's good. So your eyes are doing better. I take it. Well, well, uh, they're, they're not doing better. They're just sort of holding on. They're, well, at least they're not getting worse. No, no. Well, anyway, I'm not getting any younger. I get it. Mine. I know the feeling with my left one with my detached retina five years ago. Now it's. I'm just trying to hold on to what I got. <laughs> That's what I'm doing too. That's it, brother. I understand. Okay, and and uh, we'll talk a little bit more. I know since you're only a stone's throw from Cobb Island, and I know you've been over there a bunch of times, whether hunting or fishing or or just. Uh, sightseeing. Tell us a little bit about the, the Cobb influence and the Cobb Island ways that you... Well, <clears throat> I guess I really got wrapped up in Cobb Island when Henry Fleckenstein was writing a Southern Decoys. He asked me to do the, you know, the local research. Mm -hmm. You know how Henry was. Mm -hmm. uh, see what you can find out about Cobb Island for me. And I just sort of took a, took interest in that and went to the courthouse and did uh, turn the courthouse upside down for records up there and talk to the old folks wherever I could find them. Mm -hmm. and so anyway, and, and Oyster, Oyster right up here, you know, with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's just right here. It's right here, and I love history that happened here. Absolutely. Not, not, not uh, in Asia or someplace, ancient times. This is right here. Right, absolutely. And, and I, I know you've been over there with your with your younger brother, uh, Tommy O'Connor. I know you guys have gone and done a, your, or your partner at crime. I don't know which is more appropriate. <laughs> no, don't don't call him a brother. <laughs> <laughs> what, would he not approve of that either? Uh, he might, but <laughs> uh, no, he, he's, he's a pal. He's your a pal. pal. I got you. I know. And right next door. That right next door where Robert Andrews, the Smith Island carver, uh -huh. running curlews, that's where he lives. Oh, okay. And his daughter-in-law was still alive when we moved here, when we anyway, yeah, were married at the time. And she was like a mother to me and my wife and the grandmother to my children. Mm -hmm. She was a sweetheart and she knew stuff. She was a smart woman in a, a country kind of way. And she said Captain Bob was a very easygoing man, big fellow, easygoing, happy kind of fellow. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it was all right here. And I met Roy Bull. When, as soon as I hadn't been here a month when I met Roy Bull. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And his collection was just, you know, immense. Right. And I go down there and he says, yeah, look on us. He said, you like, take it home with you and study it. Mm -hmm. So it was like going to a library. Right, a decoy library. And that's what it was. And it was no checkout or something. You see, bird in it? Yeah. And he was a Mitchell Fulcher make that. Take it home and study. Keep it for a week. There you go. And whatever it was, I just ran home and studying for a week. Yeah, nice. Anyway. Yeah, and, 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 and Roy grew up, what, or his home was, what, two miles down the road? Yeah. South of here? Yeah. About that. And after I uh, came here, I started making heads for Roy. Dipper heads and ruddy duck heads. Made hundreds of them. Just heads? Hmm? Just heads? No, anyway, so I was just making them 50 cents a piece. Oh, boy. I thought I was in tall cotton. Making yeah. big bucks. Right, well, yeah. Now, what was he doing with just the heads? Uh, he, well, he... He couldn't carve, he was making bodies for him. You've, you've seen him. Oh, okay. Uh, he couldn't carve a head. No, <laughs> no. Well, he, he really couldn't carve a body very well either. He could get by. But it was suffice. But anyway, I made the heads for him. And, so did that and met people here. And decoys here are part of the culture. Yes. They're not a duck or what? A, a decoy, you know, what is a decoy? A decoy for what? No, talking about decoys here. 
you know, we should talk about it. It was a common commodity. You know, it's not some rarity. To put it's meat, to put food on the table. You needed them. Yeah, well, that's a tool. Tools. Tool, tool, that's where you're hungry, yeah. Exactly. So, so here, it's a perfect climate for, for the carvers. Just like, well, Frank Finney, mm -hmm. Mark McNair, Cameron coming up here. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of the, uh, in the culture, in the climate. Right. Makes sense, makes sense. Getting that word out to the younger carvers, uh, I know a lot of them come to visit you. There's a lot of young guys out here collecting now that are in their 20s and 30s and 40s, but they and they're hunters and and they want to carve decoys. So are you, are they, you think the word's getting out to these younger guys? No, 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 no. But well, they're interested in computer games or whatever, mm. whatever they're doing now. So the under 20 crowd is fading. You think? Uh, well, the, the, the interest changed, you know. Right, right. You know, that's what you want to call it, fads. You know, right. outdoor fads has faded into the cyber age. Of, I couldn't tell you what, the, what they're thinking about now. Yeah, no, I got you. I mean, it's been a lot of talk I've, ever since I've been around about how the young people are not it. Well, you know, I was a young person 30 years ago when, when I was starting, and I... Uh, um, I don't know. I, I've, I'm kind of encouraged. I see a lot of what I can, well, younger than me guys and girls that are collecting and at the shows and enthusiasts and that are into it. And so I've kind of been surprisingly um, surprised at the uh, the interest with some of the, you know, the 40 and 30 and 20 year old olds today. So I don't know. I don't, oh, I, I don't know either. I just like to see people you know, with the idea of hunting, has carved their own. Mm -hmm. There's just, just so much satisfaction in making something yourself, for one thing. Right, and using it. And and, and make it with a, a purpose, you know, and, a, and a, you know, a challenge. Right, absolutely. Because I remember the, the first ducks that pitched to a rig of decoys that I made, they were broad bills. There was snow on the ground. I had a mama's bed sheet wrapped around my shoulder next to a piece of driftwood mm -hmm. old stump and these broad mills come in and pitch to pitch right into my decoys mm -hmm. and I stood up it was didn't even fire didn't I had a gun in my hand I just strutting up and down the beach <laughs> like a rooster they worked <laughs> I fooled them I was boy you could have had them if you wanted them oh my, but I was just so proud to see see them come to the ducks yeah. and, and ducks are Looking at me, and they soon took off, but I was still strutting up and down the beach, yeah. crowing. Satisfied. Oh, well, I was proud. Yeah, I never, excellent. Yeah. Well, and I think about the, the words in the Joel Barber's book, the introduction chapter, chapter one, of all the birds susceptible to the lure of a decoy, I'm the most gullible of all. <laughs> Amen. I think about yeah wise yeah. words wise words yeah well um hits it go ahead and start talking about toots well, toots also told me one time that he was just having a good time carving well i call it carve like toots well i'm having just as good a time that's right um, when i'm out here in my shop I'm just as happy as a schoolboy played in the mud hole. <laughs> and mom and daddy are in the house. <laughs> you do it all you want. <laughs> That's good. Pete, you talked earlier about you've made decoys in various styles of, of influence. Yeah. Now talk about the creativity and how that works with you, your own creativity. and. Well, you know, when you go to school, you start out making ABCs like your first grade teacher. You know, and you got your knuckles busted if you didn't. <laughs> and then by the time you get in high school and everybody's got their hand, their own hand. Mm -hmm. And the same way with wood, learn from the old folks. And 
years later, and this is, I got my own hand, just went in my head, and it just comes out of my hand. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's a, that's your creativity. Oh, so anyway, I get tired of making one thing one way, like, like the upper bay birds. I get tired of that. I'll, I'll get one. And that, that's what I love most about Northampton County. We're here, the rule, the exception is the rule. Mm -hmm. Everybody, especially Hog Island, they had, the, they had an imagination. And that's what I get tired of making something. I just start with a log, start chopping, and let my hands do the carving. Don't even think about it. According to the wood. Just my hands, hands are just subconscious. Well, mm -hmm. got something might look folky. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Gotcha. Various styles, various creativity moments. Okay. Thank you very much. We enjoyed you taking this time with us. We appreciate it. It's been fun. It's been informational, and I hope uh, uh, people that don't know you want to come meet you now after. Uh, Maybe seeing this, or you know, this is their first introduction to Pete Hurricane Peterson. And before I go, I meant to ask you this earlier and I forgot. How did you get the Hurricane Monitor? <coughs> well, one of my side jobs at, at the concrete plant for my boss at that time was selling uh, sodas at dinner time. And he would send me to the bottling plant in Cape Charles to get eight or 10 cases of sodas every morning. I was on the payroll. I just kept my mouth shut. And the woman over there, they were friendly people. And I go through the door and, and just pull up a chair. And uh, one day it was hot, blazing hot. And I come come in there to, just in the, air control, in the air conditioning office, sit down and she said, boy, you come through that door like a hurricane. <laughs> Excellent. So I went back and told the boys at the concrete plant, and that's, that's where it came from. They hung it on you. Yep. Well, that's yeah. interesting. Because I don't do anything fast. <laughs> well, we certainly appreciate you doing this fast interview, and it's been a pleasure here in Pete Town, USA. USA.